father to the fatherless, defender of the weak, freedom for the prisoner, we sing, this is God in his home. and cry out awesome is our strong God mighty is our God mighty is our
Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I don't know when you're going to be watching this, uh, but uh, I just want to welcome you. You know, um, I know we have been doing this differently, uh, virtually, uh, and even though I miss being with you guys, I really do. I miss being with you guys. I miss seeing you guys. I miss uh, conversing with you guys on a Sunday morning and being in person, and, and this, this is all going to pass, and there's going to be a time where we will be able to come back together and worship together once again, and I'm looking forward to that. But I've also been very excited. I want you to know that I've been very excited uh, from the perspective that it's forced us to become a little bit more creative. It's forced us outside of the walls to do the, you know, to share the gospel, uh, to share the good news, to share about the kingdom of God, and that's okay. Uh, and when we read throughout Scripture, we see that there are times where Jesus, uh, uh, specifically um, God the Father, uh, through Jesus and through other different mechanisms, uh, moved the church, uh, if we could say it that way. He moved His people. Um, I think there's times where we get stagnant. I think there's times where we get comfortable. I think there's times where uh, God uh, chooses to move us, and He may have to use different things, chooses to use different things uh, to move us uh, to be able to share His gospel. I think of the early church. You remember the persecution they went through um, after He ascended back to heaven, and they were in Jerusalem, and they were coming together in one accord, and uh, the church exponentially grew. But then right after that, major persecution took place, and it dispersed the church. A lot of times we look at that, or we may look at that, and say, why? Why would that ever happen? But God chose, I think, to use that, uh, to use other things. I don't think God necessarily makes bad things happen. In fact, I won't say necessarily. I don't believe that happens at all. I don't believe God uh, creates and makes bad things happen. Um, but I do think He uses things uh, for His glory and His purposes. And I think in this particular situation uh, that we're going through, uh, it's certainly something that is very unpleasant, very scary at times. But God is, is, is great. God is gracious, and God still loves us very much. And um, I think He's using this time to share and spread His gospel in ways that, uh, that where we had become stunted. Uh, not just us as element, but the church as a whole. And so for me, I'm excited. I've been excited. And so uh, this is just another mechanism, but I still miss being with you guys. And I look forward to the day when we get together together and worship Him together and, and just come. Uh, that's going to be a cool time. That's going to be a cool time of celebration. But I hope we don't go back into a way of being stagnant and being comfortable with a system, which is so easy uh, to do. Um, I'm excited to pick back up in Matthew. If you remember before all this went down, and it's been weeks, right? It feels like it's been a long time. Uh, but if you remember, we were in a series called The King of Thrones. And I want to pick back up on in that series. Um, I want to pick back up on uh, where we left off. And that was right when Jesus was uh, inaugurating His ministry. He just called his, some of His disciples to follow Him. And the next passage we're going to kind of take a look at is the Sermon on the Mount, what we would call the Sermon on the Mount. That's found in Matthew chapter 5. But before we get started, I want to lead us into a word of prayer and ask God's blessings upon our time. So if you would, bow your heads and your hearts wherever you're at, and may we just take a minute and ask God to His presence through His Spirit to be with us. Father, I thank you for this time uh, that we can gather together uh, the way we are, uh, that even though we're not physically together, we are together spiritually. You have united us and bonded us uh, through your Spirit. And so I pray that you would just be with us as we look to your Word. I pray that we would be able to worship you in a very powerful way today. I pray that our hearts would uh, lean into the things that you want to share with us. And more specifically, too, I just want to ask that you would guard our hearts right now for these next few moments so that we would not become distracted. We would not allow Satan to uh, get our thoughts and minds off of uh, hearing what you want to tell us. So we just uh, commit this time to you. And at the end of the day, I pray that all that we do and say would just bring you glory. And I pray all this in the most powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 
If you would, uh, turn with me to chapter 5 uh, in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. And again, we're picking back up where we left off in this series called King of Thrones. And uh, very excited today to, to, to share with you the Word and to just kind of draw our attention back to uh, the Gospel of Matthew. If you remember, we are setting the, or we, we're talking about how Matthew, the author of Matthew, is pointing out to his audience, his readers, that uh, Jesus is the King, that Jesus is the rightful heir to the throne, not just in a physical, temporal sense, earthly sense, but also from a more so from a spiritual aspect, that this is the Messiah, this is the Savior. In fact, that's what he said, right, in the beginning of chapter 1, uh, and that's what we'll take a look at here in just a few moments. But uh, as we look at this passage of Scripture, if we could, if you could back up just a couple of verses in the last part of chapter 4, Jesus is beginning his official ministry. And in chapter 4, verses 23 through 25, we see what's taking place. He's teaching, he's preaching, He's healing people, and as he's doing this, the good news of this is spreading throughout uh, the country there. The good news is spreading throughout the regions, and consequently, because of this, people are coming out of the woodwork uh, to, to see this person, Jesus, to see and hear, uh, to hear the authority of his teaching, and uh, probably more specifically, to be healed. Because it says in uh, verse, if you would, uh, chapter 4, Verse uh, 24, it says, Then the news about him spread through Syria. So they brought him all those who, who were afflicted, those suffering from various diseases and intense pains, uh, the, the, the demon possessed, the epileptics, and the paralytics. And listen to what he said. It, and Matthew says, And he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So these people are coming out of the woodwork to see uh, who this Jesus is uh, to, to, to come and to be healed. In chapter 5, the next chapter, it says this, and I'm gonna, I, let me just read uh, verses 5, verses 1 through 12. And today's going to kind of be an intro to the Sermon on the Mount, because this is the greatest sermon ever preached. Obviously, Jesus preached it. Uh, but this is the greatest sermon ever recorded, uh, and it's Jesus teaching us. And I want us to really lean into this. A few years ago, a handful of years now, we preached through the Sermon on the Mount, and we talked about it. And it's so it's going to be fun to revisit this and to glean some of the um, other truths and things that uh, we might have uh, not picked up on, or we, we will be reminded of those. So in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, listen to the words. Of Matthew, it says this: When he saw me, or me, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, and this is what he was saying, verse three: The poor in spirit are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Those who mourn are blessed, for they will be comforted. The gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed for they will be filled. The merciful are blessed, for they will be shown mercy. The pure in heart are blessed, for they will see God. The peacemakers are blessed, for they will be called the sons of God. Those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And then, he, and then it says in verse 11 and verse 12, You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus goes up uh, on the mountain, on the mount, and if you've been to Israel, uh, it's not really a mountain per se, but it's this, it's this hillside uh, that leads down into the Sea of Galilee. Just a beautiful, beautiful area. And when you go there, you can just picture uh, what that would have been like uh, walking or kind of uh, going up and sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing him speak. But as he's talking, uh, our translation, our English translation uses this word blessed. And I want to make sure we have the proper understanding of it because sometimes uh, we view this blessed as a sense of happiness. And even though that's part of it, that's not the extent of it or perhaps uh, the, the extent of how we would define happiness. Okay, And 
this word blessed uh, throughout uh, the the you know the uh, translation of the scripture uh, could could was used about three different ways. The first way, blessed means it's uh, something that's set apart by God by a blood ritual to be consecrated. Okay, something that's set apart to be consecrated by God, to be used for God uh, through a blood ritual. It's something that, that would be used for God's service, something that is consecrated, for instance, like us as, as believers. The second thing is uh, the, the second translation or um, that the, 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 the we can uh, pick up on with this word blessed is that it means to speak well of to eulogize or praise God, but to eulogize, such as bless your enemies, it means to speak well of your enemies, to eulogize them, to, you know, something we do at a funeral, right? We come, we deliver a eulogy. That's correct. We deliver a eulogy. We eulogize. We speak well of someone. That's what Jesus says about blessing your enemies. Bless your enemies. How do you do that? You speak well of your enemies. And then the last one, number three, is to be happy or joyful. And it combines, really, this third one kind of combines all of these together, where it means that we've been set apart, we've been consecrated, we are set apart to praise, and, and there's this sense of happiness that goes with it. So this third aspect is where Jesus really takes this. It's probably the, the better translation of the word blessed, and, it's, and again, it's encompassing all of these. And Jesus is telling his listeners how they can be deeply, spiritually, and profoundly happy, okay? Not just superficial happiness, but this deep spiritual happiness, this contentness, uh, of, of, uh, and how to maintain it. Not just this fleeting moment, uh, but how to maintain it, even in the middle of something that may be painful, even in the middle of something that may be uh, not pleasant whatsoever, sort of like what we're experiencing now. How are we functioning and living our lives today? Are we crumbling? Are we cracking because of the things that's happening in and around us with this whole uh, COVID-19 coronavirus thing? Or are we truly content? Jesus is saying, this picture of Jesus is saying that we can be content, we can be satisfied, we can be full of peace, we can have this deep sense of soul satisfaction. And Jesus is telling his audience that if they truly desire this, if they truly desire to, to possess this, that it's not based on fleeting circumstances, that it's much deeper than that. There's this deep-rooted, deep-seated sense of happiness. Now, his words, as you can imagine, is re are really the antithesis of what, of what the world tells us how to be happy, right? You know, what would make you truly happy today? How would you answer that question? What would make you truly happy today? If Jesus was standing before you and said, what can I do for you? What would make you truly happy? What would you say? Would you say, well, I would like for there to be a vaccine for the coronavirus. I would like there to be a vaccine for cancer. I would like for there to be a vaccine for uh, Alzheimer's or um, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or these other things that just plague us and take loved ones from us. Uh, we would say that would make us happy. Would it be financial stability? Would it be, you know, our portfolios, our retirements? You know, uh, would it be, I want to have more money uh, within my bank account? Would it be in relationships? Would it be, my relationships are not sound. My relationships are very fickle. So it would be, you know, happiness for me would be relationships or power or prestige, prestige, whatever it may be. What would you say that if you truly possess today, if you were given this today, what would you say, I would be 100% happy and content? How would you answer that question? And in the past, has there been a time where you've identified those things only to receive those things, work towards it, obtain them, attain them, whatever it may be, but once you have it, you're really not 100% happy? deep down soul satisfaction, deep rooted happiness. You attained it. You obtained what it is that you set out to obtain, but you're still not quite that happy. You see, the most profound, deepest sense of his teaching could be stated uh, in verse 20. If we could jump over to verse 20 in the same chapter, chapter 5, the most profound sense of his teaching could be stated, stated and summed up this way. He says this, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Now, why would I say that? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. And just like last week, I'm going to take a few minutes to answer that question. Because I think if we look at Jesus' teaching here, the Sermon on the Mount, if we would look at it this way, we're going, to un- we're going to discover something truly profound here. Think about this. At the beginning of Matthew's gospel, he is calling attention to the sins of God's people, right? At the beginning of Matthew's gospel, if you would look at chapter 1, if we would go back to chapter 1, verse 21, do you remember what it said? Chapter 1, verse 21 says this, She, meaning Mary, the virgin, will give birth to a son, and you are to name him what? Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. At the beginning of Matthew's gospel, Matthew is identifying something. He's identifying that sins is really the root of all things, right? And interestingly enough, if we would flip over to the backside in the end of Matthew's gospel, what do we read about? We read about the cross. We just talked about this last week. We read about the cross of Jesus. And at the end of Matthew's gospel, he's calling attention to the death of God's Messiah. So working backwards from the cross and taking in this verse 20 of chapter 5, we find a very deeper profound truth here, right? We we go over to the we work backwards from the cross and then we we look at verse 20 again that says unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What does this mean? It means that everything Jesus taught was something that we look at and we say these things um, that we must do to be accepted by God, okay? Now, let me rephrase that. That sounded kind of confusing and I may have confused myself. What I'm saying is, when we look at the, ma- when we look at the rest of Jesus' teaching, for, for a lot of times what we can say is, well, these are the things that I must do to earn the righteousness of God. These are the things that I must do to earn the acceptance of God. I must be poor in spirit. I must be mournful. I must be gentle. I must be hungry for righteousness. I must be merciful and pure in heart. I must be a peacemaker. I must be accepting of being persecuted. But the problem is, if you're tracking with me, it's not something that we must do. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. These don't make us right with God. Okay? Are you following with me? Are you tracking with me? A lot of times that's how we read the Bible. We say, I must do these things to be accepted by God. I must do these things to be right with God, to be righteous before God. That's not true. That's a distraction. That could be a lie. Wow, that's pretty powerful to say, right? Well, what is it that I'm saying? What I'm saying is to do these things does not make us right with God. To do these things does not make us right with God. What makes us right with God? The cross of Jesus. That's what makes us right with God. The cross of Jesus. Again, the beginning of Matthew, you're going to call him Jesus because he is the Savior of the world. He's the Savior of you from your sins. And then the end of Matthew is about the cross. And then we work backwards, we read that that is what makes us right with God. We begin to understand that truth, that the righteousness of Jesus is given to us by God. He gives it to us as a free gift. It's not what we do. It's not what we do. Now, what do we, how do we look at this then? Well, we continue to look at it to, to understand it's the cross that's what makes us righteous. It's the cross that restores that chasm uh, between us and God that has been broken that we talk about. The cross is what restores us and restores our relationship with God. The cross is what restores our fellowship with the Heavenly Father. So what does this mean then? When we talk about the Sermon on the Mount, when we talk about um, you know, Jesus sitting down and saying, these are the characteristics you must take on. Well, these characteristics, uh, the, the, they begin to demonstrate themselves in us. Why? Because we are right with God. Does that make sense? We can't miss that truth. When we miss that truth, it's a futile attempt to be right with God. 
God's righteousness is given to us as a free gift. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we begin to discover that this is what truly provides us righteousness with God. These are, these are the things that are being demonstrated through us because we are not living for ourselves anymore. We're allowing Jesus to live in and through us. We're, allow his, we're allowing His Holy Spirit to manifest its, His fruit in us. And when we, uh, we set our selfishness aside, when we deny ourselves, take up the cross of Christ and follow him daily, these things begin to become demonstrated within our lives. We become poor in spirit. We become mournful. We become merciful. We become peacemakers because his spirit is producing, the, uh, is producing those things inside of us. Do you understand that? Our life begins to exemplify these characteristics because Jesus is, has, is seated on the throne of our hearts. Does that make sense? These aren't things that we extract out of here and say, I must do these things. These are things that are exemplified within our lives and demonstrated within our lives because we have received his free gift of grace and salvation and we're taking ourselves off the throne of our hearts and we're placing Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Palm Sunday, about him coming into our lives and him being Lord of our lives. That's what he produces. And consequently, when that happens and these become demonstrated within our lives, we begin to sense this deep sense of satisfaction, of contentment. Because it's not us living our lives, it's Jesus living his, himself through our lives. We are submitting to his lordship. The question becomes, are you happy? And if you're not happy, perhaps he is not seated on the throne of your heart. Guys, I get that we're human. <laughs> As I've said before, I'm human. I know that's a shock for some of you. I get that we're human. I get that it's a struggle. I get that it's a daily battle at times to allow Him to sit on the throne of our hearts. But when we allow Him to sit on the throne of our hearts and these things manifest themselves within our lives, within, our, with, within who we are, that's when we have this deep sense of soul satisfaction that money can't buy, that relationships can't produce that, the, that um, the cures and vaccines of, of, of the sicknesses and the diseases of our world will never provide that sense of hope and peace that only He can. That's where a, a deep sense of, 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 again, of soul satisfaction, of peace, of happiness, of being blessed comes from by, again, allowing Jesus, denying ourselves, and allowing Jesus to sit on the throne of our hearts, and picking up our crosses and daily following Him. Are you daily following Him? Have you received His free gift of grace and salvation? Are you trying to do what only He can do within your life? What he can, only He can produce within your life? Are you trying to do those things out of your own futile attempt? Because that is it. That's the definition of futility. That's the definition of an insanity, is trying to do the things that only the Spirit can produce inside of you. You want to have a deep sense of satisfaction? Allow Jesus to sit on the throne of your heart and allow Him to produce these characteristics within your life. I hope and pray that you submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and you begin to discover how to be deeply soul satisfied. I would like to close with a, with a, with a word of prayer and I pray that you would just uh, maybe close your eyes right now, lean into, uh, lean into this prayer as I, as I just uh, close my time with you right now and um, just ask God's blessings and His Spirit to move within our hearts. Would you pray with me? Father, we give you great thanks that this is not based upon our own human strengths, that this is not based upon our efforts, that there's nothing that we can do to become righteous with you, but instead it's by allowing you to sit on the throne of our hearts. I pray that, that um, as people hear this, that they would, um, if they're struggling with that, they would, begin, they would begin to yield the power and the throne of their hearts to you. I pray that, are, that if there are those that are watching this video, uh, that 
they've never received your free gift of grace and salvation. And consequently, they're not happy. They're not blessed. They're constantly searching. They're constantly putting their faith into things that cannot produce what they truly desire. I pray for those that have placed their faith in you that are distracted, that have bought into a lie, that have bought into something that sounds so real, that sounds so much like the truth, but it's not. I pray that they might find the truth. And as you said, the truth will set them free. Father, we give you great thanks today for never leaving us, for never abandoning us, for always giving us what we're truly searching for once we yield our heart to you. Thank you. We love you and we give you praise and glory today. May your name be blessed. And it's in your name we pray these things. Amen and amen. Guys, it was awesome worshiping with you uh, virtually. Uh, and I look forward to uh, next week as we will continue on our passage and dive deeper into the Sermon on the Mount, talking about the King of Thrones. Have a great week.